A flowerless world with silent forests. A world of dung and old leaves and rotting carcasses accumulating in cities and roadsides. A world of collapse or decay and erosion and a loss that would spread through the ecosystems. Clinging to survival in a devastated world and trapped in an ecological dark age, the survivors would offer prayers for the return of weeds and bugs. Hello, bug friends. Today we are talking about the insect apocalypse. Now, why would it even matter if insects completely disappeared? Well, in 2018, a study was done and suggested that insects in the United States, and now this number has probably increased because of inflation, but as of 2018, insects produced 57 billion, with a B, dollars worth of ecosystem services. And if we expanded this out worldwide, it was about between $235 billion and $577 billion worth of ecosystem services that these lowly and humble, beautiful bugs do for us. What are some of these ecosystem services? Well, I'm glad you asked. I do have a video called Why Even Study Bugs? You can check that out, which, you know, dives into this a lot more. But pretty generally, one of the big things that insects do for us is pollination. And it's not just bees and butterflies and your typical pollinators, but flies and beetles are also really important pollinators, so much that chocolate is even pollinated by a small tiny fly. Insects are our trash collectors, our garbage men as it would be. They're taking care of poop, fallen trees, fallen leaves, dead stuff in general, like dead animals and other things. That's what forensic entomology is all based on. And all of this decomposition not only removes our trash, but also helps cycle nutrients back into the ecosystem, which is really important. Even insects that we traditionally consider to be pests, like termites, because, you know, when they get into your house, that's a big problem. They are so important to the ecosystem because they are breaking down tough, difficult to digest materials like tree trunks and cellulose and returning those nutrients back to the ecosystem. In addition to that, insects are really important for seed dispersal. Insects are also really important for the food web and not just getting eaten, but many insects are predators in their own right. Many farmers like yellow jackets because they eat caterpillars that are eating their crops. And we use a lot of parasites and parasitoids as biocontrol to keep pests off of our crops and out of our gardens and also out of ecosystems that they don't belong in biocontrol, the whole thing. We can use insects in medicine, like maggots to clean out wounds, which isn't exactly an ecosystem service, but it's still valuable. And probably most importantly to this video is that insects are the base of the ecosystem and reproducing problems here at the bottom where the insects are, we can hopefully curb the issue and save the ecosystem before it travels up the food webs and starts affecting things that are big and take a long time to reproduce and take a long time to recover. The question though, friends, is there enough evidence to determine if there is actually insect apocalypse happening? As for my personal experience, I live in Ecuador. I conduct my own personalized tours of the jungle focused on insects, ecology, conservation, and local culture. Speaking of which, our evolution tour is coming up. Stay to the end of the video to get discounted pricing and more information. So I'm out here in the jungles a lot. And when I conduct my bug tours, entomologists or enthusiasts who have seen images of what it's like to blacklight in the jungle come with this assumption that now if you come you'll see an entire sheet just covered in insects like top to bottom and while i can say that has happened for me a few times that's not the norm not in all ecosystems and not in all seasons it's just not like that anymore 
And when you talk to researchers who have been here for a long time, they talk about how they have generally noticed a decline in insects and even local people who are working in these eco lodges and maybe don't even have a scientific mind. They'll talk to you about times where lights like street lights or lights near the gas station or lights on the football fields were covered in bugs. And it's not like that anymore. Now I'm just one one dude, one girl, one one person. But these stories have been echoed. Susan Weller is a biologist who is studying tiger moths in Ecuador in the 1980s. 10 years later, she went to go back to her original study sites to continue researching tiger moths, and she just couldn't find them anymore. Just in that time frame, areas I had collected had been transformed. Forests had been taken out, brand new cities had sprung up. I tried to go back to collect from other historic collection sites and those sites no longer existed. They were parking lots. So the question is, where are all of the bugs? Do you love bugs? Remember that meme that was circulating for a while, that comic? That is a phenomenon that now has a name, which is called the windshield effect. However, it's not just affecting windshields, it's also affecting streetlights, backyards, keep getting questions, where have all the fireflies gone? People are noticing. The problem is people in general, including scientists, tend not to notice when we are losing things, but only once the thing has been lost. This makes it hard to even think to study if we're losing things because it just doesn't occur to us. The other issue is that we are just experiencing ecosystem degradation and have been for an incredibly long time. So this is called the shifting baseline problem, where each generation is like, yeah, yeah, this dumpster fire looks like the new normal. And then it doesn't seem extreme or crazy. It just feels normal, even though someone a couple generations ago would look at where we are now and freak out. So each generation just gets used to the amount of degradation that they were born into, essentially. We believe that these ecosystem losses or animal losses, species losses, decline in abundance, et cetera, et cetera. We believe all of this really started in the 20th century. Really, by the 1950s and 1960s, it accelerated. And it's estimated that since the 1970s, animals have lost 60% of their members. As one scientist who is noting the decline in butterflies noticed, all we can do is wave our arms in the air and say, it's not here anymore. So that's kind of where we are right now. Letter to Someone Living 50 Years From Now by Matthew Olsman. Most likely, you think we hated the elephant, the golden toad, the thylacine, and all variations of whales harpooned or hacked into extinction. It must seem like we sought to leave you nothing but benzene, mercury, the stomachs of seagulls rippled with jet fuel and plastic. You probably doubt that we were capable of joy, but I assure you, we were. We still had the night sky back then, and like our ancestors, we admired its illuminated doodles of scorpion outlines and upside down ladles. Absolutely there were some forests left, absolutely we still had some lakes. I'm saying it wasn't all lead paint and sulfur dioxide. There were bees back then, and they pollinated a euphoria of flowers, so we might contemplate the great mysteries and finally ask, hey guys, what's transcendence? And then all the bees were dead. So those are some anecdotal stories, but what is the research telling us? Now, when I go over the research, I'm going to say some studies that were particularly important at the time, how their methods were conducted, and essentially what they found. We are going to save all of the problems of the different papers for a different part of this video, and that's just because a lot of studies had similar issues, and I didn't want to repeat myself a bazillion times. So this, just, just what the studies did and what they found. In 2014, there was a study that I feel like was largely slept on, and this was a meta-analysis. Basically, a meta-analysis looks at a whole bunch of studies that have already been done, takes all of the data, conglomerates it into a larger data set, and then tries to look at overall themes and trends with all of these different data sets from all of these different resources. So 2014 was a meta-analysis. This paper by Dierzo really argued that we should be using the word defaunation as much as we use the word deforestation because they were noticing declines across the board. They noticed that on average, 
vertebrate species had a 28% decline in abundance and assumed that invertebrates had similar declines, although back then in 2014, there wasn't nearly as much data on insects as there is now. Now, I literally wrote this stat down about four to five times because I could not believe it, but they argue that between 11,000 and 58,000 species are lost every single year, which crazy. They noted that coming up with similar estimates for insects was difficult because only 1% of the 1.4 million described invertebrate species had ever been studied in the capacity of possibly losing them. And of that 1%, 40% of that 1% were insects that were threatened. Of the monitored 452 globally monitored insect species, we have noticed a decline in those species since the 1970s. For example, Lepidoptera, which are butterflies and moths, are really well studied. And so the paper found that there was a 35% decline in Lepidoptera, so butterflies and moths, in 40 years. And so the conclusions of this paper were that Maybe we should start talking about insects as functionally extinct. Maybe it doesn't matter if there's not even one left on the planet, but when their population numbers get so low in the wild that they're no longer able to meaningfully contribute to the ecosystem, maybe that's when we should start thinking of them as functionally extinct and treating them as if they were. Then the paper that really started the conversation that dropped in 2017, and this was a bombshell. This is what got everyone talking because the stats in this paper were so astronomical. And it came from a surprising place. It wasn't a university study. This study came from a group of enthusiasts and hobbyists and amateurs out of Germany. Now, this is so important for me to mention because so often I have people telling me, oh, but I don't have a formal degree in entomology, I can't do anything. Or I don't have a formal degree in entomology, I can't be an entomologist. And like this study to me really, even though I've been saying that it's hogswash for quite some time now, this study really, at least to me, like proves it. Because it didn't matter that these guys weren't formally trained entomologists. These guys were going out, collecting data every single day. They just loved bugs. They were out in these areas. And they came out with this paper that said that insect biomass had declined by 75% in just 27 years. And during the peak season of summer, it had declined by 82%. Now these numbers are huge and astronomical and this really got the scientific community chatting about this. Now this study used malaise traps, which catches flying insects and they were just looking at biomass. So basically if you put all this stuff in a jar and you weigh it, how much does it weigh? This study was using data from 1989 to 2016 in 63 different nature preserves throughout Germany. This was a big deal because these are supposed to be protected areas. And in these protected areas, we're noticing this giant decline in insects. So what's going on? It was kind of generally assumed at the time that maybe this was just a one-off or something that needed to be investigated more. But then literally, bam, one year later in 2018 from across the world in Puerto Rico came a study that showed that insects were declining there too. They used data from 37 years from 1976 to 2013 in a conserved forest called Luquillo in Puerto Rico. They checked several different elevation points and used a variety of trapping methods, including canopy trapping, they used sticky traps, sweep netting, and they also studied not just insects, but things that eat insects. They had found that their sweep net samples had decreased by four to eight times and that their sticky trap samples had decreased 30 to 60 times. And so to put it into perspective, an average sample went from 483 milligrams to eight. And they saw this across the board. Now they were like, okay, insects are the basis of the ecosystem. Other things eat them. Let's look at anoles and some birds. And they found declines in insect eating lizards and insect eating birds as well. And so they argued, is there an imminent ecosystem collapse? If the base is declining so much and we are seeing these declines carry up through the food chain, what does that mean for the ecosystem? Now, this wasn't the only study that was looking at the decline of insect eating predators. About half the birds in farmlands disappeared in Austria by 1998. 
and over half a billion birds had disappeared from Europe. Interestingly, a study came out from England that showed that 58% of farmland butterflies also disappeared. And I know that England and Austria are two different countries, but it seems like they're kind of pointing in the same direction. Even previously abundant, what were called junk butterflies, were also disappearing. Checker spot butterflies, which were really common throughout California in the 1960s, had all but become extinct by 2000. Here are a few example shotgun studies and findings during this period of, oh boy, looks like we're losing stuff. In 2006, fewer moths were being found at light traps in Britain. In 2010, firefly experts had a conference basically asking, where have all the fireflies gone? In 2016, a really interesting study out of Ecuador showed up, which was looking at beetles on the various mountains. Now this study to me is really interesting because this study looked at rain shift, whereas many other studies did not. This study was conducted in Ecuador on a couple of the different volcanoes here, and they were looking at carabid beetles, which are ground beetles, which are endemic to not just Ecuador, but specific volcanoes. Endemism means that you can find that insect or that organism in that one place and nowhere else. So some of these beetles are not just endemic to Ecuador, so you can't find them outside Ecuador. They're endemic to the mountain that you find them on. Very rare species. They found that one species living on the volcano Pichincha lost about 90% of its habitat in 100 years. And another beetle they found in just 27 years got pushed 400 meters or 1,300 feet up the mountain. In 2017, the rusty patch bumblebee was put on the endangered species list because it had been noted that its population had declined by 87% in 20 years. And in 2018, a study done on monarch butterflies in California noticed that they were also reduced by about 86% since the previous year. So between 2017 and 2018, monarch butterfly population in California decreased by 86%. Then it came the reviews and the meta-analyses because by this point, all of this, oh my gosh, we're losing stuff, is gaining traction. And now instead of just studying butterflies here or moths there or beetles here or that there, scientists are now looking to try and conglomerate a lot of this information and disseminate the general trends and talk about those general trends and what it might mean for us. In 2019, Gulliman came out with a literature review and it was basically a summary of everything that had been found thus far. It was very similar to the pop literature articles to the New York Times, or the Guardian that were also coming out around this time, except I liked it because it linked all of its sources. In 2020, Clink came out with a meta-analysis. This meta-analysis looked at 166 long-term research studies ranging from the years of 1925 to 2018. They looked at abundance, how many there were, and biomass, if you add them all up, how much do they all weigh? And they generally found that terrestrial arthropods were declining by 9% per decade, which strangely enough, aquatic insects were increasing by 11% per decade. They also found that insects were generally declining in Europe since about 2005. And while the study was fairly comprehensive, most of the research data and studies that they were using and the study sites they were using had come from mostly North America and Europe. That same year, another study came out by Crossley. Now this study was robust. It was looking at the United States. It looked at 68 different protected sites throughout the United States. They looked at a wide swash of bugs. They looked at randos that are normally left out of studies like this. They looked at pests, they looked at aquatic species, they looked at terrestrial species. And if they had data, they used it, they didn't throw it out. And this study seemed to contradict everything that had been found so far. They basically found there was no increases or decreases in anything, anywhere, at all. So that was perplexing. In 2021, Wagner comes out with a literature review called Death by a Thousand Cuts, where he tried to parse out why we were seeing some of the trends that we were, and also generally problems that we were finding with the studies up until this point. He deduced that there was a one to 2% decline in insect biomass overall, with some figures as high as 10%. He also deduced that some insects were increasing in number, and these insects included moths in Europe, temperate insects, 
and also insects that were closely associated with humans. So bees or sometimes even things that we use as water quality indicators like mayflies and caddisflies. In 2023, Clink came out with another meta-analysis and this meta-analysis also included modeling. And this was trying to get at some of the disparities that we were seeing in these various studies and was also trying to look more at this problem through a nuanced lens. Instead of just biomass or just abundance, what if little nuances within the insect populations actually mattered? So they had three main models that they were using. The first one, what if abundant insects were decreasing faster than rare insects? What if both rare and abundant insects were declining at the same rate? And what if rare insects were declining faster than abundant insects? Now they built these three models, they put in all of the data from their meta-analyses. In the meta-analysis, their data on average was a range of 20 years, but they had some studies that were just nine years worth of data versus others that were all the way up to 64 years worth of data. And they used more recent data and included data sets that hadn't been used before. So they had data sets from 2018 to 2021, and they were also using data sets that were in different languages, including Chinese, Portuguese, and Spanish, which had traditionally been left out. So they got a lot more data to feed into these models. And they found that model one, which was a model that predicted that abundant insects would decline faster than rare insects, is the model that fit the meta-analysis data the best. So basically what they found is that if your bug tends to be very abundant, it suffers losses faster than insects that are typically rare or have less abundance. And one final study in 2023 done by STAB, which I wanted to mention, even though it's not a literature review or a meta-analysis, but I think really starts to turn the tide about where the research is going, really started to look at not just abundance, not just biomass, but nuance about the insect's life and also nuance about the composition of the habitat. They studied 140 forests in Germany over three sites and looked at things like if the insect is a predator or prey, like how high up the food web it is. Are there a lot of this bug? What happens in forests that are mostly native trees? What happens in forests when it's deforested and cut down for timber? They found that if your insect is a predator, and especially if your insect is a top predator, it is more likely to suffer effects and decline than other insects. They also found that if your habitat is full of native trees, that overall helps the problem of insect decline, which, you know, makes sense. You keep the habitat the way that it is and it does better for everybody. <laughs> And they also found that if you cut a bunch of trees down, that also increases insect decline. So they really talked about how there's nuance and how these nuances and how we study the insect and their behaviors and their lifestyles matter. And they also really studied how the composition of the forest really matters and really wanted to broaden it out to what land management practices might look like. With all of this mismatched information, is there actually an insect apocalypse? Well, according to Ed Young, a respected science communicator, claims that insects will disappear within a century are absurd, but the reality isn't reassuring either. Now we're moving on to the problems of a lot of these studies. If you've been paying attention thus far, you may have noticed some of these problems yourself. And I always encourage you to look at scientific literature with a little bit of a grain of salt because scientists are humans too. Like, and even though we try our best to be non-biased, and even though we try our best to include all the variables, sometimes it just, we, just, we just miss things. And sometimes like funding, time, et cetera, just doesn't allow us to do everything that we want to in a study. The first glaring problem is something that I mentioned way back in the beginning of this video, that we tend not to notice or think to look at declines until we have already noticed losses. So in many cases, we just may be too late already. Many studies showed the same general issues. So I'm just going to lump all of the issues that I find together in clumps. And we'll only mention specific studies if I think it's particularly relevant. The first problem, especially in these meta-analyses, are just the biases that happen when we are studying science. 
So because we can't go back in time and be like, oh, we should study this exactly. We are stuck with what someone 100 years ago decided to study and hope that it's relevant. So for example, my friend who was sitting at the University of Georgia with me, she was really interested in tiger beetles. And so she was doing a study on tiger beetles and if they could be used as habitat and quality indicators. And part of the reason why she could do this is because she could collect tiger beetles now and compare them to historical collections from the same spot to see if you can find the same species and relatively the same abundance. And that was only possible because some dude in like the 50s or 60s decided that he really liked tiger beetles and just collected tiger beetles for a whole bunch of years for funsies and then donated that to the museum. So that study, her study was only possible because someone had just done the legwork randomly before because tiger beetles are shiny. Many studies were just conducted in one place, in Europe, in Germany, in Puerto Rico, in Ecuador, in Panama, in the United States, etc., etc. So when you get enough of these data points, you can start to make some generalizations, but especially at first, when that Germany study came out in 2017, one of the big questions was like, can this even be applied? Maybe this is just Germany or just those forests. And so all of these individual places are great places to start, but they can't necessarily be broadened out further. There is a huge bias towards North America and Europe. That is where most of the studies are conducted and that is the data that most of the meta-analyses are using. And despite that only 20% of insects live in North America and Europe, that is where the majority of our studies are coming from. What about the tropics? What about Asia? What about Africa? What about Australia? You know, all of these places are important to also get data from. Many of these studies aren't even looking at the differences between rural and urban environments. A lot of these studies are just looking at protected areas, which can tell us a lot about our conservation efforts but also maybe lacking the bigger picture because, you know, cities are not that great for insect biodiversity. And one guy basically just brought a butterfly back from the brink of extinction because he just potted some flowers on his patio and that made a huge difference. As one researcher who's studying butterfly says, I don't cover the globe, I cover I-80 which is a very good general summary of the situation at hand. There's tons of bugs and identifying them is very hard. In many cases, insects can only be identified down to species via a specialist. And sometimes that specialist doesn't live near you. Sometimes you're in California and you are mailing specimens out to some dude who studies just forward flies in Australia. So if you want to get more nuanced data, it can be very difficult because just studying and identifying bugs is difficult. Because of this, many studies just look at abundance or biomass, which can be good approximations, especially if you're just trying to see are there changes, but misses a lot of nuance. This misses if there's changes in species composition, this misses if there's range changes, and it misses if we are losing rare or endangered species. Collection techniques favor flying insects. We use a lot of malaise traps, flight intercept traps, sweep netting, canopy traps, and these are all looking at mainly insects that can fly, even sweep netting. You can like sweep net through the grass, but all of those or most of those insects can hop and or fly away. And so a lot of these studies are missing ground or soil dwelling insects or insects that are living in the leaf litter. You need specialized equipment to look at them like for lazy funnels or pitfall traps, which can come with their own issues, especially pitfall traps. I've tried to pitfall trap in the jungle before and it can be difficult because it rains and they flood. Certain insects are just studied more and have more data. Insects that are pretty like moths and butterflies and beetles are particularly studied or insects that are endangered or insects that are associated with humans tend to be studied more, but we're missing a whole bunch of other bugs, like all those soil dwelling ones like I was talking about, but also like ants and shield bugs and lace wings and mantises. I mean, there's tons that we're just missing. While we know a lot of baseline data for some of these insects that are associated with humans, there's a lot of insects that not only do we just not study very much, but even if we did study them, like we caught them, we wouldn't know anything about them because there's just no baseline data on them. There's tons of insects that we don't even know what they eat. And yet 
we're trying to see if they're disappearing, but we don't have any baseline data on them. Understanding some of this baseline data for a wide swash of insects, like are they herbivores or predators? How high up in the food web are they? What are their niches? Where do they tend to live? Like when is their mating season? Things like that can be really important and can produce a lot of nuance and help us define these studies and hone them in a little bit more. I think this is where studies are going, especially looking at the two 2023 studies that really try to look at and get at a lot more of this nuance. So I think in the future, this is where studies should ought to go and probably are going since now we have determined that abundance in biomass probably just doesn't cut it anymore. Maybe areas in the United States, like the prairies, we forked those ecosystems up so long ago that now we are only looking at the, what has happened after the catastrophic change. And there's some evidence to suggest that the prairies will never be the same. And if they are, it will take at least a thousand years to get there. So there's no way for us to use data in meta-analyses that actually represent what that ecosystem was before we just farmed on it. So much of the data that we get is correlative or qualitative at best. So for example, the 2006 study that showed that there were fewer moths at the light traps in Britain, is it showing that there is an insect decline or is it showing that moths just don't show up to lights anymore? And there is some evidence to suggest that moths are avoiding lights in cities. It's also difficult in these meta-analyses to compare all of these different data sets. This data set is nine years. That data set is 20 years. That data set is 64. This data set, it studies three sites. That data set studies 140. So throwing them all together and doing statistical analysis on them is not as easy as you might think. There, there are a lot of challenges to using these big data sets, and especially when these different data sets are looking at abundance or biomass. and there's just different factors all around. <laughs> the other glaring issue that you might have picked up on is that some studies agree and some studies don't. Insects are declining a little, insects are declining a lot, some insects aren't declining at all. Not here, no declines here. Oh, if you're associated with humans, you're increasing. Oh, if you're water associated with water, you're increasing. Oh, or, oh, you're temperate, you're increasing. Oh, you're like a trophic predator, you're decreasing. Like, it's all over the board. So uh, that's not great when you're trying to construct a story. So what explains this mess? The best possible explanation is that you can't treat bugs like a monolith. Insects are a big and complicated group with over 1.4 million described insect species. Comparing all insects and throwing them all in together would be like doing a biomass study, but taking fish, gorillas, elephant, deer, and house cats, and throwing them all into a biomass study. You'd be like, uh, oh, they don't even live in the same place. This is, this doesn't even make any sense. And that's kind of what we're doing with insects. To solve these problems, more nuanced studies are just needed. And finally, another big problem is that people just don't give a about bugs. Unfortunately, I've said it, I said it, there we are. I mean, I know you care about bugs. You were here watching it with me. So thank you so much. But for the majority of people, bugs just like aren't on their radar and therefore bugs are just not being funded. Classical science, like basic taxonomy. What is this? What does it belong to? Where is it? And basic ecology, like what does it eat? How does it interact with the ecosystem? Just isn't being funded. People, especially the public, assume science now, we are in 2024, is like big machines, lab coats, indoors, beakers, flasks. But a lot of basic science is a lot more simple than that, and in all honesty, a lot easier to fund. A great example is one of my favorite studies is actually about this beetle, that's my tattoo, which uses the stars to navigate. And the way that they figured out this was literally just putting them out in the desert and like gluing little visors on their heads so they couldn't see the stars. That's science too. And it's hella fun <laughs> and great reading, but it's just not what people think of when they think of science. And so it just isn't classically funded anymore. Talk to anyone who's trying to become a taxonomist and they will tell you gladly, woefully, the troubles of trying to become a taxonomist, trying to get grant money and just trying to get people to care. Because people don't really care about bugs, the government doesn't really see the why we need to fund them with their tax dollars. And in some cases, we can make big steps 
backwards, like under the Trump administration, when he took away a lot of environmental protections. Now let's look at the trends. What we can generally think we can say is going on. As I mentioned, we have some studies that are contradictory. So why do we think that we can see some of the trends that we are seeing? Let's first look at increases in insects or no changes across the board. A 1992 paper suggests that maybe insects just have big wide sweeping fluctuations and that weather from year to year like really matters and we're just in a big spell and we're just seeing huge fluctuations. As for the increase in freshwater insects, we had a huge program to clean up our waterways. Maybe it worked because the water doesn't suck anymore. Maybe US and temperate insects are just incredibly robust and resistant to change. America. <laughs> that would generally fit the trend that temperate insects in general are increasing, but that may be because they are having a rain shift. Instead of dying out, they are just moving to other ecosystems that are slightly cooler or slightly more protected from the increasing temperatures. In addition to their range possibly moving, their range can just in general be expanding. They just may be tolerant to warmer and cooler temperatures and can just kind of live all over the place. Grossly in 2020 suggested maybe we just had sampling problems. Maybe it, maybe these increases or whatever actually don't have anything to do with biology, but just how we did the studies, question mark. Maybe part of the increase that we're seeing is invasive species or pest species that are closely associated with humans that easily transport between different places and across borders and generally don't have predators here, hence them being invasive, and so they are skewing the results. We've seen a big increase in pest beetles, so Japanese beetles, tree boring beetles. Again, I imagine in the Northeast, lanternfly data is probably gonna skew a bunch of stuff if you don't account for it. And finally, we may be seeing increases because our conservation efforts are working. That study in 2020 that looked at different protected sites across the United States, yeah, maybe those protected sites are protected and conservation is working. And so we are not seeing losses in those areas because yay, conservation. Now let's look at why we might be seeing some of the trends in relation to insects decreasing. The biggest, easiest one is that human population is increasing and everything that that suggests is affecting insects. I saw one argument that said that maybe agriculture is responsible for all this decline, but I don't think it's just agriculture, to be honest. I don't think you can just blame agriculture for everything. Is it a large part? Yeah, probably, but I don't think it's the only reason. In the paper, Death by a Thousand Cuts by Wagner, many of his findings were echoed by others in other papers as well. He just made like a nice little chart with all of the things. And here are some of the reasons Wagner suggests for the decline of insects. We have global warming and climate change. Insects are just being killed out, pushed in other regions, or their ranges are shrinking. Invasive species and diseases can affect native populations. And so you may have a boom of invasives, but that is killing out everything else that is there. Same thing with diseases that are transported. Pollution, everything that entails, not just like plastics and soda bottles, but light pollution, air quality pollution, we have soil nitrification from fertilizers and agriculture, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, all of that is in the water and in the ground. And insects, especially predators, are very sensitive to all of those different chemicals. And so generally, insecticides that we're using on crops disproportionately affect predators than they do the pest that is eating their crop. We have urban expansion and just land use in general, right? So like cities, suburbs, shopping malls, farms, highways, roads, like all of that stuff is habitat destruction and is just cutting through things. I know a lot of people when scientists have to collect insects, we will get a lot of flack for that. I mean like, oh, you kill these insects, you say you love them, but the reality is like you will kill more insects with your car than most collectors could even ever collect, even for scientific study. Habitat loss is also contributing to range reduction in these insects because we have just cut out a lot of the space that they need to live. 
And in my opinion, nowhere is an isolated island. You may have the most perfectly preserved nature preserve, but what's around it? What's seeping into that perfectly preserved ecosystem? I see this in Mindo. I go to Mindo a lot, and a lot of people expect to have a lot of insects show up at the black lights. And in my experience in Mindo, that is just not the case. There are other cloud forest reserves that I think have better chances of getting insects at the black light. And it makes no sense because Mindo is very well conserved. So the only thing that I can think of is that maybe something like flower farms or the major highway, stuff like that is seeping down and affecting the habitat in Mindo, even though Mindo is working very hard on conservation. So I think looking at some of these surrounding areas can be really important. And finally, now what? Where do we go from here? How do we start to fix this? Where we are now is actually pretty promising. We've had a lot of legislature protecting insects. In 2017, there was that big like, California bugs are fish, har, har, har. But that was just like the way that they could legally add insects into clauses that already existed was the only way to really do that. And so the fact that they did that is amazing. Like that's really important that insects are now protected in legislature. More species than ever are listed as endangered species, especially pollinators. It has been traditionally very hard to get insects onto endangered species list because C point A, people tend not to care about bugs. The Endangered Species Act is really important when we're looking at land use. So for example, when I was working in the Albany Pinebush Reserve, I was working with the Carner Blue Butterfly, which is an endangered butterfly. We were doing butterfly releases and lupin counts, which are their host plants. But a lot of people had a lot of restrictions in the area around because of that endangered species. People couldn't have pools in their backyard because the butterfly could drown in them. You had to plant certain flowers, that way it would have food. The town wanted to expand the main road, but the butterfly couldn't fly across a four lane highway. It could only fly across two lanes. So when you put something on the Endangered Species Act, there comes a lot of legislature with it to help protect the environment that it lives in. In 2018, there was the Agriculture Improvement Act. And similarly in Europe, they banned the use of certain pesticides that were affecting pollinators. And in 2018, Europe put in legislature to protect pollinators specifically. We've had some big breakthroughs in funding, which is really important. Pollinator funding has skyrocketed and organizations like the Xerxes Society are getting more donations than ever. If you want to help and you don't want to go outside and do science, you can just donate to various places that are working on insect conservation. Or come on tour with me. <laughs> the German government gave $118.5 million to insect conservation after that 2017 study came out that showed the insect decline. In 2020, Costa Rica had a project that was internationally funded $100 million to categorize and catalog every multicellular creature in Costa Rica. So I'm really excited to see how that progresses. So two, now what? What are our next steps? We have some funding, we have some legislature, now where? We need more long-term studies that are nuanced with more standardized results. That will help a lot because that will help clarify some of this mismatch story that we have. We need more urban studies and especially studies that are urban versus rural environments. For example, I helped collaborate on a study in 2020 here in Quito looking at an endemic butterfly, an endemic subspecies of butterfly to Quito that was basically using the medians and a non-native mistletoe to lay its eggs on. Uh, so that was, you know, urban stuff. Very interesting. And finally, we really need a consensus, a conversation and an agreement between scientists and lawmakers. So land use should be scientifically informed and harvesting timber, where you're putting nature preserves, area around nature preserves, what habitat conservation looks like, what urban sprawl looks like. All of that will be important for legislators and scientists to discuss and make decisions that are scientifically informed and research-based. And then there is you, good friend, the citizen scientist. You can join citizen science projects. There's several on monarch butterflies. There's several bird and butterfly counts in Europe. The Xerxes Society has a whole page about how you can get involved and how you can help. You can just donate money 
money helps too. You can use iNaturalist and if you're in the United States, bug guide and document and upload what you're finding. I imagine that meta-analysis is in the future are not going to just rely on what scientists have officially collected and gathering dust in a museum somewhere, but are also going to start using documentation from some of these digital platforms, especially iNaturalist, which will mark your particular photo or your observation as research grade or not. So I can definitely see those being important and photography in general, especially as cell phones are getting better and better and better and the average person has this in their pocket. You can definitely see how these are going to be important in the future. And just the bug love, just caring, just knowing that these are problems is so helpful. Like, thank you so much for watching this video and watching my channel. If you're able to coming to Ecuador, because all of that helps conservation, all of that helps get people involved, realize that bugs are important and hopefully will help us address this issue of the bug apocalypse. Thanks so much for watching and getting through all of this with me. If you're interested in going on the evolution tour with me, you can now watch the trailer right now. Use the code LOVEBUGS10 to get 10% off at checkout. If you wanted to go to the Amazon, now is your chance. Booking is only open until Valentine's Day or February 14th. Check out the Evo tour link in the description below. People of the internet. John Perry here. In today's video, I just found this pile of crazy stuff that washed up on the beach. Hello, bug friends. My name is Nancy. I am an entomologist. That's my master's degree, haphazardly taped to my wall back there. And I conduct tours of Ecuador focused on ecology, conservation, and bugs. If all you eat is leaves, you're probably picky. I like that there's a stick for reference.